Welcome home. It's Irish Family History with curious news and notes. Celebrating our fourth year of this podcast at the Irish Roots Cafe, where every day's a holiday and there's always room for one more. One of six broadcast series from the head school at irishroots.com. I'm Michael Laughlin, your host, publisher of rare Irish books and uh, information on every county in Ireland since 1978. Be sure to read our blog, complete with links to click on from this podcast, and search our master index and books for free. Molly, wet the tea, Katie, bar the door, Sweeney, clear that floor, and bring out the Irish dancers. It's time we get this show on the road. Well, we've got a very special episode of the Irish Family History Podcast. This is number 154, our podcast series here. And uh, we're going to return a little bit to the interview format that we've had in years past. And we might do more of that this year because there sure are a lot of smart people out there. Today, we're going to be talking with Frank Delaney, who's been the author of books like Ireland and Tipperary and Shannon. And his latest is Venetia Kelly's Traveling Show. It's a novel. And uh, Frank also tells us about the history of the Delaney name and the two different Delaney families. Some of them might be French. Some of them might be old Irish. And we also cover St. Patrick and uh, changing the national anthem and all kinds of things. It's a treat to listen to this fella. He's a good one. And we'll have more about it on the blog and some more links at the end of the show. Uh, So here we go. Our interview with Frank Delaney. Well, today, like I told you all, we've got a special guest, and uh, he might have some insights into the Irish heritage that a lot of us uh, uh, today look and don't understand because we haven't looked at the past quite as much as he has. He's done several books, excellent novels, uh, books like Ireland and Shannon and Tipperary, and the latest one is Venetia Kelly's Traveling Show. Now, that sounds interesting, uh, but before we get into the book and the history uh Frank, could you tell me a little bit about your ancestors and any ties you might have to Ireland? Mike, with a name like Delaney, you have to look very carefully into your past, especially if you're Irish. And there are, <laughs> there are two Delaney's. There are two families of Delaney's. Yes. One, one is French, and that's the more recent one. And that came in, you know, quite late in the day, around 1167. Right. They actually, they actually came in in September 1167 into County Wexford. Um, but long before them, um, traceable to the year, in writing, traceable to the year around 460, a few years after St. Patrick arrived, uh, there was a family of Delaney's in North Tipperary, South County Leash, and that's the family I come from. And the same name is still there all the time. So we're a traceable family, probably one of the 150 sort of petty families, petty in the sense of small, um, that governed Ireland when St. Patrick came there. That would include people like McMahon, O'Brien, O'Connor, O'Donnell, O'Neill, which is one of the oldest names in Europe. And the most common Irish name of all is Murphy. Oh, I know it. Incidentally, O'Loughlin, O'Loughlin would be in that uh, group of 150 as well. O'Loughlin, your name, is one of the oldest names in Ireland and is completely traceable down the centuries from at least 500 AD. Yeah, I, I've, I've gotten it back there just past the Norman invasion, and uh, uh, some folks say that the O'Loughlins might have come down from the north. They might be related to the MacLachlins, but yeah, I, yeah. I haven't checked the, the DNA yet to find out. But, you know, on Delaney, how do you uh, uh, figure out that how the spelling came about with a D-E at the beginning of the name? Well, it's, I can tell you exactly where it comes from. Um, the Irish word is Duchloina. D-U-B-H-S-L-A-I-N-E. And it means the black-haired person, that's the dove part, the word Duffy, right. Duff, comes from a person with black hair. Yes. And the Thloina is bravery. It's, so is, that, is, is the river, there's another meaning it come to in a moment, which involves bravery, but that's the river Slaney in County Wexford. So one branch of the Delaney family migrated, it is thought, from the banks of the river Slaney in County Wexford to North County Tipperary. Now, the other thing is, in the around the 600s, there were such battlers and such stroppy, difficult people that they were given uh, the, the, their very name meant courage, meant, you know, rumbustious courage. So the name Thutlon means bravery and courageous. So the two names became synonymous with each other down through the years. The French name is a totally different one. That is de Lani or de Lani. Yes. And that is, and that is from the people who made linen, from the people who made cloth. 
That is the origin of that, or so I've been told in Paris. Yes, and that, well, and, and because of the similarity of that name and the English language being introduced into Ireland, that's why you end up with the final spelling that you get to, and pronunciation on Delaney. And there's an interesting, subtle thing about it in Ireland, especially down in the southeast, where those Delaney's first came ashore. In County Waterford and South County Tipperary, the name Delaney is spelt D-E-L-A-N-Y. Yes. Whereas the original Irish name, like mine, is spelt or is spelt D-E-L-A-N-E-Y. And though I notice that here in the United States, some people misspell my name D-E large L-A-N-E-Y. Yes. As, as though it were French. And yes. I, find that, I find that actually quite appealing. <laughs> if your name has to be misspelt, let it be misspelt like that. Well, you know, since you know so much about the Irish history, what about uh, Patrick, St. Patrick? Do you uh -huh. believe he, uh, several men, where did he actually come ah, yes. from? He, 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 was, he was actually, he was the son of a Roman civil servant. Yes. And he was taken captive um, when they came over as part of the Roman civil service. His parents lived in, I believe the town was Ballantrae on the coast of Scotland. Mm -hmm. And he was taken in a raid by Irish chieftains who were looking for cattle. There were rustlers, but they were also looking to take slaves. And he, as a boy, was taken as a slave and put into servitude, what they called indentured servants in those days. Indentured, by the way, I always think, meant having your teeth kicked in, right? <laughs> which is what happened to a lot of them. Yes. But he worked as a slave on the hills of County Antrim in bleak weather, tending sheep, and he escaped. And he came back to Ireland to evangelize them. He went back to Rome. He became, uh, the family were Christian or became Christian. He became a priest. He became a bishop. And he was sent back to Ireland at his own request to evangelize and convert the people to Christianity. And that's exactly what happened. It's pretty well documented. And his own writing discusses it as well. People forget that he wrote. He was a very good poet. He may have been a cranky and difficult man, which he was by all accounts, yeah, but he well, was also a very good poet. Did, if you read his confession, uh, uh, that I believe they say is, is pretty well authorized or authentic, yeah. uh, uh, you know, you think about the celebrations today and maybe a little bit of overabundance and how he starts oh. off his confession. It's like, I, Patrick, the rudest of men and the poorest of sinners. He doesn't start off as a big partier, does he? He doesn't start off as a big party. You've raised one of the most interesting things you'll ever come across in your life here <laughs> because it is thought that he may actually, in the course of his escape, have killed a man. Uh, Hence the atonement. Yes. It is very possible. Human life was much cheaper back then, although sometimes I wonder. Yeah. Um, but he may, in fact, is thought some Christian scholars have put that interpretation on it, that he may actually have killed somebody in his bid to escape or in self-defense while he was working as a slave, and that that is why he act actually had to escape, that he killed somebody on the farm on which he was working or on the land on which he was working and had to leave. And I, f I find that completely fascinating, and that, and that as an atonement, he came to evangelize the Irish. Yes, there certainly seemed to be something in the background there that Absolutely. brought about the attitude and... Uh, very interesting. Well, yeah. now, now, what about the, uh, the uh, your recent book, mm -hmm. here, the uh, 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 Venetia Kelly? How does that come about? What kind of setting is it in? And uh, <sighs> can you help any of us, our family researchers, understand maybe what our families were doing in that era? Ah, uh, yes. This is set in 1932. What I'm doing at the moment, Mike, is I wrote this novel called Ireland, which, as you know, is a kind of tour of the horizon of Irish history since the time the tectonic plates moved and threw up the rocks that eventually became Ireland. Yes. And that brought us up to 1916. I then decided that to, to try and understand this country, it's 33,000 square miles, but how in the name of all that's high and holy did it daub such a wide green stripe across the planet? What other country in the world has a national day observed by everybody, everywhere? Yes. Nobody has. The Irish have St. Patrick's Day, which is known and loved and revered and celebrated, certainly, all over the world. So how did that come about? So I set out to try and understand it, and to do so, I decided I would write a set of novels that went up a decade at a time through the 20th century, the time of my parents' life, my grandparents' life, and indeed my own. So I'm up now to 1932. Um, Shannon starts with the land wars and ends in 1922. Sorry, um, Tipperary does. Shannon happens in 1922-23, the Civil War. This one happens in 1932, the year of a great and pivotal general election. And Venetia Kelly's traveling show 
is one of those strange theatrical troops that traveled the country bringing entertainment and theater to the small country towns and I knew them well as a child and sat there transfixed as they gave us extracts from Shakespeare in with fire eating, juggling and acrobatics. And the star of this show is a lovely young actress called Venetia Kelly and she's the top of the bill because she's also a ventriloquist with a dummy, a ventriloquist's doll called Blarney and she enters him as a candidate in the election. So if you've got a ventriloquist dummy who nearly wins a parliamentary seat, what else do you need to say about politics? <laughs> Only in Ireland. <laughs> Only in Ireland, although sometimes I wonder too. <laughs> well, yeah, that's spreading out too, I think. Absolutely. So this, this is like a traveling, a traveling circus? A traveling circus, a traveling show. They go from town to town. They entertain people. They pack the halls. Remember, we're talking pre-television and even pre-radio. They pack the halls. They have a wonderful time, and people come in there to see them. And the narrator is a boy of 18 called Ben McCarthy, and suddenly one day his father announces that he's running away to join the circus. And Ben is sent after him to bring him back and says, what in the name of God are you doing? And then, of course, Ben falls in love with the same actress that his father falls in love with. Now, Mike, as they say, now read on. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm just, you know, I've been reading a little bit now and then in some of the Irish news that people are starting to remember the famine more, which, of course, is, is generations before this story set. Uh, it's almost like, according to some people, the Irish sort of just put the famine out of their memory and didn't want to bring it up, and so it didn't really figure in everyday lives. Is, is that so? My father wouldn't talk about the famine. My father was born in 1894. Yeah. His father, my uncle told me, his father, that's my father's brother told me this, his father walked through places that the famine had visited, and it shaped his life. It, 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 it just depressed him so greatly. The men of my father's age... Um, would not discuss the famine. My mother would because she was a good deal younger than my father, but she wouldn't talk about it much. And where I grew up, there was a kind of instinct that, you know, you invited people for a meal, but you didn't let them into the house while you were having your own meal if they hadn't been invited because you didn't want them to see how much or how little you had on your own table. Yeah. So the famine was high in the race memory and the race consciousness when I was growing up, but my goodness, they would not talk about it. Yes, it's almost like a war. People wouldn't talk about the war right after it happened here in the States, well, I know. Viet Vietnam. Nobody talked about Vietnam for years after it was over. It's only now slowly beginning to come back into the consciousness in a big way. There yes. were occasional stabs at it, movies here, books there, so on and so forth. But it's, it's not settling into the consciousness yet. And I found this interestingly when I went to Germany to work in the theater in Germany in the, in the 1980s. I found that only people of 20, 25 years of age wanted to talk about the war. The rest didn't. Yes, that makes sense. There was a kind of shame. In fact, in some some parts of the Irish language, the famine is referred to by the word shame. And there's a kind of shame that we allowed ourselves to endure it and got no help from anybody. And were forced, and we died and we were forced to emigrate in huge numbers. Yes. And that was a national kind of shame that nobody wanted to talk about either. That's well, and they're still they're still debating things about the famine and how it was caused and why yeah. and uh, the fact that there was food there for some people but not for others. But there was a potato famine, a potato blight, which which struck the of course the 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 land uh, dwelling people the most, the regular citizen. And the interesting thing about it is that it was haphazard. One field of potatoes would be destroyed. The field next door, fine because the wind blew the spores and winds go everywhere they want and that's what actually happened so people didn't know whether their fields were going to be safe but the one thing my grandfather described apparently was that he always knew when he was coming through an area that had famine because it was totally silent the birds were gone the animals were quiet the dogs didn't bark it was totally silent and that's how he knew Yes, and, and, and I guess the uh, it wasn't just the famine, it was the resulting disease. After, while you're being starved, your, your, your resistance is down to all sorts of problems and infections, and uh, they, they say most people died from the resulting disease uh, right. rather, rather than the actual starvation. Um, the, the narrator of, of this novel, Venetia Kelly's Traveling Show, is a young man called Ben McCarthy, and at the end of the book, he ends up working for the Irish Folklore Commission as a folklore collector. 
and he goes around the country. Now, the Irish Folklore Commission is very famous among academics interested in how we lived long ago because it set out to collect all the traditions, the songs, the stories of the Irish people from as far back as they could, the ones that people told at their firesides. And in the Irish Folklore Commission in Dublin, I found in my father's handwriting eyewitness accounts of the famine that he had collected in County Tipperary from people who had been through the famine or whose parents had strong memories of the famine. And he wrote them out in his very careful hand, as so many country people did, and sent these off to the Folklore Commission. Oh. And and the descriptions are horrific of people standing. The authorities dug open trenches along the road signs, open graves, and the instruction was you stood on the bank of this thing waiting for a food cart to come by. If you died before the food cart came, you fell backwards into the trench, and that's where you were buried. Uh, and who would want to remember any of that with your friends standing next to you and some of them didn't make it? Absolutely. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, oh, wait. And, you know, you know, they're uncovering, I imagine a lot of that stuff still has got to be read by the public uh, that's been sent in, but they're even, they've just discovered a lot of things about the, uh, the Civil War era in the 17th century, 1641. They've discovered some uh, payment rolls and some witness accounts, of course, supporting, uh, uh, so, shall we say, that's Cromwell's right. position. That's right. That's and, right. And my, my, my sons, I have three sons, and they now are passionately interested in the history of their own country. And they're hearing things from me that they never learned at school. Yes. Yes, that's, uh, I, I, yeah, I can understand that. Have you, you know, you've done a lot of research. Have you seen any nooks and crannies where uh, there's some Irish names sitting there that uh, an Irish researcher in America might think about looking at as a uh, last resort? Oh, Mike, it's all nooks and crannies. Yeah, I know. I know <laughs> where you go. If you want to start, if you are researching your family, if you have an Irish name and you were researching that family name, and the, the here is the first port of call. The first port of call is the Irish Genealogical Survey at Dublin Castle in Dublin. They're on the net. They are wonderful. They are, they are just... They can't help you enough. And to go there, I've sent a number of people there, friends of mine there, and they all come back saying... What an experience. There's an old saying, you know, in, in life, Mike, uh, possessions don't bring you joy, experiences do. Well, that's a joyful experience if you're looking for your family because they're there to help you and they want to help you because we Irish are passionately interested in our own race and the names of our own race. So if you've got somebody who's got an Irish name like your own O'Loughlin, that's where you begin. Either you write to them or you go online and you look at the website or better still, you go there. <laughs> you know, that changed my whole life because if I had been able to just press a button on a computer and find out the history of the O'Loughlin's, right. I, I would have said, well, that's nice. And I would have gone on and told people right. I knew where I was from. But right. they, they didn't have it when I started. So I actually went and stayed at a and b with people with my name. Yeah. And, and got a feel for the people and the records right. before right. it was so easy to get. And uh, that started my whole career. I changed everything I was doing. Wonderful. Wonderful. It's very, it's very uplifting. You know you come from something. You know that you have an importance on the planet. You come from a family that has survived a long time. The family name is still there. You have not been an annihilated, and you now have an identity with greater depth in it than you had previously known. How can that not do your spirit good? Oh, that's right. And I remember on, on our first trips back there in the late 70s, I took groups, groups over researching, and uh, the very first trip, the bus driver said, you know, I didn't understand why all you folks would come over here to Ireland and make me drive this bus around to little old graveyards and you'd get out and tramp through the grass that people would never go through and mm -hmm. over here. He says, I didn't understand it. He says, but once I saw the tears well up in the eyes of some of these ladies that are researching, uh -huh. he says, I understand now. He says, we have something here that we don't know. We don't know we have how lucky we are. We have our roots right next to us every day. Here's the point. Here, here's the major point that I'm always trying to get across. I never write about the impoverished Irish, the drunken Irish, the poor, the rowdy, the fighting Irish. I write about the people I grew up with uh, who were very comfortable. We lived in a land of big farmers. And yes, there was some poverty. There's poverty everywhere, regrettably. But it's not, it's not the, 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 the drunken pigs in the parlor Ireland is something I never saw. Yes. We come from, we come from, the Irish come from a very proud and brilliant people, brilliant people. Um, we have a long, deep history where our civilization is astounding. Our scientists were able to build tombs 
to celebrate the dead as far back as 3,300 BC, like the tomb of New Grange or Nauth or Douth nearby, mm-hmm. where on a specific morning of the year, the sun hits an exact spot 70, 80 feet inside the tomb. Now, they didn't have computers. They didn't have scientific instruments. These were our people. They then went on to create some of the most beautiful artwork in the world, like the Book of Kells, like the Arda Chalice. And all the time, we had in our heritage a fabulous, fabulous store of literature, like the great Celtic legends, the Ulster cycle, the Fenian cycle, the stories of ancient Ireland, which I am always retelling in my books. We are a hugely proud people to go and research that and suddenly realize what you come from. We are one of the most distinctive races on the face of the earth. Why would you not want to find out where you come from in that race? Well, I know it, and and, and how how poetic it is that the people who came here with the least uh, 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 now end up celebrating there once one day a year in great uh, fanfare and style, and everybody's welcome into that that parade rather than being an exclusive... uh, You've got to prove yourself Irish bloodline. We sort of welcome everybody in, and I, th- I think that's important. Absolutely, but bear, bear in mind what we come from. We came from one of the most distinctive and brilliant earliest civilizations in the world. Yes, and uh, latest DNA studies showing that R1B DNA, uh, it comes back from like the Ice Age when uh, uh, the, the Irish West Coast, the DNA is amazingly right. uh, pure, which is, which solid, is yeah. yes, surprised a lot of Absolutely people. Absolutely solid, yeah. They, they thought it'd be ameliorated with all the invasions and, and whatnot, but uh, it's really defined a, a characteristic of, of our, just of our own. What about things like, uh, I hear rumblings, uh, some people want to change the national anthem because it was written during times of, of fighting for your freedom, so it might be a little too uh, militaristic, and some people are saying, let's change that. Have they, have, they have a new version, a song called Ireland, written by a, a man from Derry called Phil Coulter, and there's a lot of controversy about it because it's a new tune, and... They're arguing that we have so many wonderful traditional tunes. I agree with his argument, by the way. I don't particularly like the new one. Mm-hmm. I agree with removing the militaristic one. My God, if you listen to the words, if you knew the translation of the French national anthem, the Marseillaise, it's the most bloodthirsty thing you've ever heard. Yeah. The, the Star Spangled Banner, which the music of which was written by an Irishman, a harper called Turlock O'Carlin, that's about battles as well. It's time to move on with all these anthems. It's time to put the militaristic thing, certainly where Ireland is concerned, behind us. But if we are going to have a new anthem, and the new anthem is supposed to take, why don't we have it based on one of our glorious, old, traditional tunes that are so lovely and so haunting? That's my point. Uh, well, now, I know your bo- your books will be everywhere. They'll be at uh, uh, Borders and uh, Barnes & Noble and Amazon. Everywhere, everywhere. Yes, yes. Once you get online... Uh, uh, the object you- of the exercise is they may be about Ireland, but they're also about life. But above all else, I want people to be entertained. I want them to have, and, and this book, this particular, this new book, Venetia Kelly's Traveling Show, is getting astounding reviews. I couldn't write them myself. I would be too embarrassed. And that's wonderful. When people enjoy what you're doing, it's absolutely marvelous. And um, somebody listening to us now will find that book in the library or in a bookshop or whatever, enjoy it and pass it on. And that's how the whole thing works. And it's a great joy to be involved in it. Yes, it's a great read, and and I tell you, when I first got it, I just opened it up at several sections to see how it flowed, and it seems very clear and very easy to follow, which uh, a lot of books aren't these days. No, it's the uh, what I like to do is I like to smuggle. I like to take very big ideas and put them in very, very accessible, entertaining stories, and it's full of characters that are recognizably Irish, some of them very, very amusing indeed, or so I've been told. I found them funny when I was writing them. I laughed out loud a few times, and Robert Frost, the great American poet said, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. So I'm happy about that. And um, and both, the interesting thing about my books, Mike, is this, that both sexes read them. In fact, if I have slightly, I would say, more male readers than female readers, and they say men don't read novels. They do. Yes, yes. I get about 50-50, and I'm very happy with that. Well, I look forward to talking to you again someday, especially uh, even if it's just on history, and, and we can always... Uh, Help your books along because uh, they're a real good read, and I'll leave all the information on the blog, and uh, at the end of the show, I'll give you places where uh, our audience can uh, uh, take a look at the books and just click on a link and get there. So we sure appreciate uh, all your help today, uh, Frank, and and also your education on the Delaney name and where it came from in at least two instances. Mike, it's my pleasure. Okay, thank you very much. I hope to be talking to you later. 
That's all for today, folks. Joseph, warm up those pipes. Remember, we have a broadcast series on Irish song and recitation, on local history of the Irish in America, and on 2,000 years of Irish history, as well as on the counties, and something special coming up on Irish language, I hope. Uh, we've got all that and more at our head school at irishroots.com. And you know, we've been known to appear, exhibit, teach, and even sing for your special events. Be sure to book in advance if it's important.